Hello, my name is Stephen Chung, and this is my final design proposal for the K Blair Hospice. Since the very beginning, our initial intent was to facilitate closure, as this is one of the most fundamental aspects of a hospice, to allow friends, family, and loved ones to make peace with these parts of life experiences. Through an extensive conceptual and experimental process of research and understanding what it means to look for closure and to find closure, I have finally arrived at the final conclusion that to wander and to reflect is to facilitate closure, to seek closure through wander. There are three principles that should be followed. Number one, the circulatory space should be transparent to allow wander to occur. You must be able to see and explore with your eyes. Number two would be having places of pause to create destinations for wander to occur. And number three is to allow reflection in those said spaces, a place to mentally calm yourself and be present and approach your emotions. Diving a little deeper into the idea of wander, Wander is to walk or to move in a leisurely, casual, aimless way. As a noun, it is an act of wandering. But specifically in the case of this project, wander is taken into the context of circulation, where instead of going directly to a destination, we allow users to move indirectly to the destination. So we can take the idea of wander and combine it and intertwine it with the qualities of reflection. Looking to, for inspiration and precedence, uh, the wondrous qualities of a garden can be intertwined with the spiritual qualities of a place of faith. To transcend a typical hospice, to allow closure to happen, much of the inspiration actually came from practical means as well. As the site is in Canada, three quarters of the year are severe weather conditions. Usage of the facility without reliance on landscaping and weather conditions. Much of the circulation was brought from outside and inside to facilitate wandering. So, starting off, of course, this is our site. It's in Brampton, and zooming even further in, lays our site right here on Bramley Road. The first move we can make is the structural and spatial grid. Uh, the first orientation of grid number one is a response to the circulatory elements of the site and overall geometry. The second grid is orientated to the natural environment, specifically solar exposure. Number three, we can create a barrier uh, between Bramley Road and the site, as Bramley Road is a significant multi-lane traffic artery. It has major negative distractions. Therefore, an initial barrier between the interior and exterior creates a separation which is necessary. Beyond that, we can create a public entry to the east of the site. Uh, the entry is created in response to the service road and angled for immediate sight line from the road. The third move we can make is to position all the residents as close to nature as possible and as furthest from the distractions. Orientated at the opposing side of the site, we can allow wander and reflection to occur throughout the project. The third move we can make is to allow continuous wander and looped circulatory passages created between the public entry and private residence. This is to allow reflection that the central aspect of a circulatory passage is filled with a space, a void. Essentially, it forms a major skylight center of the project and allowing southern light penetration to make it to the residence. So we can begin to look at blocking and stacking with these moves in mind. The first thing we can do is to arrange all the private spaces to the north, as it is the furthest from circulation and also uh, arranged to nature. The second block we can create to sport and back of house spaces because it's between the residence and the service road. And lastly, the last block we can make is to put all the public centric spaces adjacent to the main entrance allowing maximum visual permeability to the public from exterior to in interior and vice versa. 
And thus, the circulatory space of reflection and wonder are central between all these spaces. It creates a practical yet poetic approach. As for materiality, there are three primary materials we'll make use of. Concrete, wood, and brick. These materials together are a perfect combination for a hospice. Providing a sense of security and grounded atmosphere with solid concrete, warming and lifting the space with the contrast of mass timber rising in the sky, and lastly, brick is laid to consolidate the two, which is a nod towards the traditional residential vernacular of the space. This is the overall context of the site, and zooming in, this is our plan. As you can see from the southeast, we have the entry, and that leads you towards the wander circulatory space, uh, which is a void in, in the center. And when you enter into this space, you will be greeted with the great room and dining room to your left. And at the other entrance at Bramley, we'll have the children's playroom and the education slash meeting room, as well as the counseling room adjacent to the education slash meeting room on the left. At the southmost point of the plan, we have the large gathering room, which offers expansive views to the southeastern baseball fields and greenery. At the very north, we have the staff support space, which offers a place for the staff to rest and an open garden that is exclusively for them that is outside of the nursing or the residential area to create further separation for their mental well-being. Here, we have a typical resident room. Every room has their own expansive garden, offering vast views to the amazing forest outside. And on the inside, curved high ceilings diffuse the southern light coming from the two skylights at the top of these resident ceilings. Moving upstairs, notice there are two staircases available. The left side is a public staircase and the right side is a staff. First, they will show the main staircase on the left. Using these stairs and taking them upwards takes us directly into the spiritual space. In this room, we'll have great views to the forest and allow introspective and spiritual connection for the users of this space. Taking us upstairs, we'll use the staff stairs this time. As we enter, we're greeted by a staff reception. And as we rise up through these stairs, we'll have expansive views all over having a second story view to the forest and, and an open concept plan for the office with a void in the center, with also a west facing window for beautiful sunsets. Here's the west and east elevation. On the west side, directly adjacent to Bram Lee, we can begin to see the facade as it responds back to its urban context. We can see a progression of scale from the left to the right of the screen as the louvers become less and less dense as they approach the south. This is to respond to the public context of the area, where the internal public program is more permeable and as you approach the left side of the screen, private. With the north and south elevation, the north we can see all the residents' rooms with the spiritual space in the center. At the south elevation, we can see similar characteristics to the east elevation. However, we can also notice the skylight that is letting in southern light directly into the central space. There are two skylights in the south elevation, the top left and the top right. The right directly exposes the reception area, and the left side directly exposes the great room and dining area. Through these building sections, we can understand in a deeper detail of how the roof interacts with the rest of the project. In section AA, it is cut directly north of south. The right side is the spiritual space, and the south side is the large gathering space. And directly in the middle, we can see the reflective space which is framed by a circulatory wander, which revolves all around this tree. 
In section BB, we can see a cut through a typical residence room. And in the center, we can see the large skylight that is being cut through with the dining hall and the great room directly underneath. And just to the right of this section, we can see a small void space that creates separation between the public and private. On this slide, we can see room sections to show at a bit more detail of how these openings in the roofs and openings through walls interact with the space. In section B1, we can see a slice through the office space and also the reception. On this next slide, we can see systems integration. Here is a, just a quick graphic of major arteries for the HVAC system. All of these vents originate from the far west, which is where the mechanical room is. This is a section of a typical residence room. We can see the supply air duct and return air duct, which are neatly stored away in the cascading ceilings, which modify the light that penetrates the room. There are gray water collection channels in the roof as well. And in the bottom right of the drawing, you can see a wastewater drain, as well as an electrical and ethernet uh, allowance in the wall. All of these mechanical features and systems all lead to the mech room, as it's in the far right of the drawing. This is a high-level building code analysis. Uh, this building and its program fits the Group B Division 2, which means this building can essentially be constructed from non-combustible and combustible construction as long as there are sprinklers and the entire building is less than 2,400 meters square, which this design does conform to. You can see the doorway widths and corridors of these spaces, which are all allocated for. Uh, and more specifically in detail, the storage of oxygen containers and the design of indoor air temperatures. And finally, here is a hard cost analysis of the project, which is based on the Atlas Group Canadian Cost Guide of the Greater Toronto Area. Breaking down each part of the project by program, we can estimate a cost, specific cost per program as well. And by calculating the square footage for each program, we can calculate an estimated cost in total. So, for the hard cost in total, this project comes under budget at $9,600,000, allowing sufficient room for soft costs and other contingencies that may occur 